Welcome back to the As of Yet uh, Unnamed podcast. We're just going to keep rolling with these episodes until we eventually come up with a name. But uh, we figure if we wait until we find a name and we wait until everything is absolutely perfect with this podcast that we're just not going to do it. Yes. And so <laughs> we're, going to, uh, we're going to roll with imperfection. Yes. Until, and we're just going to roll with it, um, which is actually a great segue into talking about what we want to talk about today, um, which is a number of false beliefs that we are we have personally encountered within our own lives. I know I have. Um, I, I came up with all of these because I've personally dealt with them. But more importantly than that, these are false beliefs that I see in our clients. I see our clients in Healthy and Whole uh, struggling with these when they're on their journey for weight loss, um, transforming their health in general. These are false beliefs that I see commonly, very, very commonly rear their ugly heads and they completely steal people's control from their lives and they prevent them from achieving their goals. Um, despite, you know, us giving them all of the knowledge and the tools and the resources and the skills that one actually needs to create physical transformation, um, these can pr still prevent you from going anywhere, from having any progress if you're not aware of them. And that's the problem with false beliefs, right? Mm -hmm. Like mostly, most of the time, false beliefs are very sneaky. We're not aware of them. Um, and there's a quote from Orson Scott Card that um, I actually first heard this quote from uh, one of my past coaches, Alex Hormozzi. Uh, everybody knows, um, a lot of people know who Alex Hormozzi is now. He's, he's kind of like really blown up recently in, in the business space. But um, He's, he loves this quote, and it's, it's really an awesome quote. Os Orson Scott Card says, this is how our humans are. He says, we question all of our beliefs, except for the ones that we really believe in and those that we never think to question, right? It's really deep. It's so deep. It's so but, deep. but it's really true because um, <clears throat> as human beings, we, we tend to get stuck in struggle, right? Um, we, you know, if... if Fitness or health or weight loss was really just as simple as calories in, calories out, food, fitness, water, hydrate, like, um, you know, all that, you know, number one, we wouldn't have the business that we have, right? We wouldn't need to be coaches, right? right. Everybody, we wouldn't have the problem that we have right. in the world where, um, I don't know, probably what, 70 plus uh, approaching 80% of <laughs> the United States adult population it's an overwhelming is number. overweight. Yeah. It's crazy, yeah. right? Um, so if it was that simple, we wouldn't have that problem. Right. So why do we have that problem? And it's because it's not that simple. And the problem is that a lot of people have deeply held beliefs, um, false beliefs even, that directly conflict with the goals and aspirations and habits and lifestyle and identity that are required for them to transform their health. And they, they sort of completely negate the effectiveness of everything that they might be trying to learn and implement when it comes to changing their health. And the problem with false beliefs and what Orson Car uh, Scott Card is saying in this quote is that number one, as human beings, we tend to really, really cling to our beliefs because we don't want to be wrong. Right. Right. And beyond that, we rarely, if ever, stop and take the time to even question our beliefs. Mm -hmm. Are they even right? Are they even truth? Do they even stand up to scrutiny if we actually stopped to question them? But the problem is we don't, most of the time, average people, we just do not stop to question their beliefs, uh, which is a huge problem in that instead they just live with them. <laughs> yeah. They live with them and they live in struggle. Right, um, which again I think is one of the main reasons why we have such a massive mental health crisis in our in our country. We talked about that on the last episode, and I think that's why we have such a huge health crisis in general um, in our country. And that's why we're doing this podcast about these false beliefs because the reality is that um, fixing your mental health and fixing these false beliefs is actually a prerequisite to being able to fix your physical health. Because if you, again, like I said, you can have all the knowledge, all the tools, all the resources, all the recipes, all the workouts, 
all the gizmos on your wrist and your phone and your computer and all the workout equipment and you can have all that stuff in the world. But if your inner game is off, right? If your beliefs are driving the wrong behaviors because they're in direct competition with all of that, you go nowhere, right? You just spin your, your wheels and it's very frustrating. So we're going to go through four um, huge, I, I would call them all false beliefs, but the, false beliefs are so broad and there's so many of them in the world. Like these are just four that we see all the time. And even within the false beliefs that we're going to talk about, there's a million other false beliefs that like are underneath them. It's the list just, goes on. It's just such a massive thing. Um, but we're going to talk about four that we, we see impact our clients the most. Um, and because of that, we assume that they probably impact you guys a lot as well. So without further ado, let's jump in to the first one. Let's get it. The, uh, the first one we're going to talk about is the, the, the belief or assumption that a lot of people have that if I don't do X, then Y or Z will happen. Mm -hmm. Or on the other side of that, if I do this, then that will happen. Right. And what I'm really talking about here is we tend to have um, these fear-based beliefs that are also rooted in like huge assumptions about how the world works and how people work and how people will treat us. And we build up these fears uh, in our head and a lot of it is fear of um, retribution, fear of people leaving us, fear of people not loving us, pe fear of people treating us a certain way. Um, and the problem with all of these beliefs is that most of the time they do not in any way, shape or form hold up to truth, right? Um, when, we have, when we test these in the real world, most of the time people are not that ugly. I don't think they're that ugly. I think, I think they're ugly people in the world, but I think most of the time people are not that ugly. Do yeah. you, you, would you yeah. agree? I totally agree. Yeah. yeah. And, um, but we build these up in our minds. A lot of times as we're growing up, especially as young children, we, we kind of, uh, collect these, these beliefs and we, we cling to them. And then these beliefs of if I do X, then Y or Z will happen. Or if I don't do X, then Y or Z will happen really starts to become our decision making paradigm. And the problem is it drives us to make decisions to do things um, in our lives or to take paths in our lives or to take on things in our lives that are completely out of alignment with what we actually want and desire and what we need as human beings. Um, and it's all out of fear, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we wanted to give a, a few um, maybe examples of this, right? But a lot of this is rooted, I think, in the beliefs of other, the beliefs that we have about what other people expect of us right? And what other people want of us. And since we're kind of way off track with those, it drives the wrong behaviors, right? And again, it's coming out of most of the time fear of retribution or loss, um, belief that this is how people in the world works, but we really have to question it. So um, let's talk about an example of this. Uh, one of the examples that I see probably the most is, there are actually two. The first one is boundaries. Yes, that's a big one. It's massive. Yeah. Holding boundaries, p putting the right boundaries in place, holding those boundaries. Um, we see this a lot with our clients because most of the clients that we coach are, are women. Most of them are, um, we have some men in our program. Uh, we, we pretty much coach moms, moms and dads, yeah. you know, and uh, but majority of them are moms, working moms, right? So they have career, they have family. Um, most of them have churches, they have mm -hmm. friends, they have all these people and all of these relationships in their life. And the number one thing I hear when they come into the program is, um, I struggle to prioritize myself and I put everyone else first all of the time. And every time that I try to get on track and I try to prioritize myself, um, I fall back into prioritizing everybody else and I start all over again. Right. How do you see this show up with your clients? I yeah, I see it happen all the time, especially like even those who have, are like empty nesters, like they do it with their jobs too. You know, they start mm -hmm. to kind of uh, view 
the people that they watch over at work mm -hmm. as their kids and everything. And they mm -hmm. um, kind of have that same issue there. So um, it's definitely like a, a story that they're telling themselves. Like mm -hmm. if they, it's just one that they've created and it's just insane that they set these expectations from other people that they don't yeah. even know of. It's like that the expectations have come from nowhere and you know, they're telling themselves a story that these people are going to respect them less or hate them if, mm. you know, they don't uphold their, their end of the bargain or, you know, are, are not a, as caring to them or, you know, or focused on themselves or, you know, examples like that. So, yeah. And I think it goes upstream and downstream, both in families and at work. Right. Um, you know, we, we like, yeah, in the work setting, you know, we, we can have these expectations or assume these expectations of people like beneath us that we, that we manage in our teams. Um, same thing in our families with our kids, the people we, we manage in our families we're raising, but then the same thing goes upstream to like our bosses, you know, are the people who manage us um, or who we answer to. And if you don't answer to anybody, then you at least answer to God, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but um, there, there are all of these assumptions that, well, if I don't um, always say yes, right. If I, I'm not, if I'm not always there, to take care of, you know, these people or to do the things for them or to run them, run the kids from, from place to place or to watch the grandkids or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, there's a deep, deep fear of saying no and, and saying, or saying no, but no comma, but, you know, or yes, comma, but, you know, um, there's a fear of doing that for retribution. Like right? if I do that, then people won't need me. If I do that, then people won't love me. If I do that, then I might lose my job because they'll find someone else if I, you know, and a lot of the times, most of the time, these are not actually true, mm -hmm. right? Um, most of the time we've just made this up mm -hmm. in our head. Um, I, I can think about specific examples with, with clients who we've had this conversation and um, we actually have them go out and test it in real life and it completely falls apart, right? right? Um, I, I, a specific example, I had a client who um, was struggling with, you know, um, their, their, uh, their kids um, always coming to them for, for help. And, and um, I said, what if you said no and allowed them to step up and to figure it out on their own? Could that allow them to become autonomous and self-sufficient and resilient in ways that they haven't been because you've trained them to be dependent on you, right? Which served your need because you felt like that's what you wanted. You wanted to be needed, yeah. right? But it's at the same time holding you back and you, you, at the same time you feel, you enjoy the feeling of being needed. You're also talking out of the other side of your mouth saying, I can't get anything done. I can't go to the gym. I can't work out. I don't have time to think about my food. Everybody needs me, mm -hmm. right? And you can't have both. Mm -hmm. And it comes down to um, when we start to pick this apart, we start to realize that, um, you know, when, when, when that person actually went out and tested that, right, their, their child the, or their, their young adult child in this instance actually rose to the occasion. They figured it out all on their own, right? And they felt good about it. Mm -hmm. And it's like you see things like that when we test those beliefs and we put them under scrutiny and all of a sudden you realize, oh, crap. Not only have I been living within this like construct all this time, but I, I realize now I've actually been depriving other people yeah. of the opportunity to grow and to, to strengthen themselves and to become resilient and autonomous. Like I see this happen all the time when people do it with their kids. Right. Right. Um, and all of it is the fear that if they don't need me, if I'm not serving them, they won't love me and need me. Yeah. But again, that doesn't hold up under scrutiny, does it? Because love is, uh, love is not something to be transacted. Mm -hmm. It's unconditional. Love, true love, real love from the people that we want it from should always be unconditional and freely given. With no, um, no, no this for that, no bartering. Um, if you've ever been in a relationship based upon that, you understand how, how flawed that it is. 
Yeah. Right. And those, those relationships never, almost never hold up. Or if they do, it's a lot of pain and misery at the same time. But in reality, we, we know that love is actually something to be freely given. And when you start to question all of this, you start to unravel, you know, the, the gunk that you've, the box, you know, you break out of the box that you've been living in. And you start to realize that I've been making decisions and behaving in certain ways for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. Right. And I've been living according to this false belief that I won't be loved and I won't be needed. When in reality, the, a lot of these people in your life already love you and they already need you just because you're you. Right. And it has nothing to do with the fact that you're going to watch the grandkids or you're going to run the, the kids from place to place. or you are going to take on this project and that project and that project? And you're going to do all the things when it comes to jobs. Yes, there, there are other aspects there, but there also has to be, you know, limits. You're one person. Right. Um, but, but really you realize that at least when it comes to your personal relationships, right? The people love you regardless. Yeah. And at, in reality, they would rather you spend less time doing for them and actually spend more time doing with them. Yep. But the problem is a lot of times as adults with kids and, and grandkids and stuff like that, I think the, the, the pitfall that we fall into is that we, um, we have trained the people in our lives a certain way and they're not questioning it either. Yeah. So it's your responsibility to start to question it mm -hmm. and to start to say, just because I've always acted in this way is not the way that I need to continue acting and behaving. And I don't, I need to break this false belief and so that I can start making the right decisions for the right reasons, mm -hmm. right? Which is for the greater good of all. Yeah. Is what we really need to, to zero in on. Yeah. Um, not only like, are they, limiting those people by you know doing everything for them and not giving them the chance to have some independence but in a way they're kind of setting a poor example you know depending on what kind of role they play in that person's life whether it's a, a mom a father a boss or like a mentor you know if you were constantly not setting boundaries healthy boundaries for mm -hmm. yourself and yeah. you know constantly giving to others and spreading yourself super thin you know what kind of example are you setting for for other people in your life so. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the, that's where it, it really is a huge conflict. Yeah. Right. Because we want to, you know, we're telling ourselves that we have to do these things to be needed. But, you know, but we, like a lot of people come into our interview to, to join the, the academy and they say, I'm here because I want to set a good example for my children. I want to show them what it looks like to be healthy. And I have to stop there and say, okay, but I'm going to challenge you. If we're going to work together, we're going to challenge you that it doesn't just mean teaching and showing your kids the example of how to eat mm -hmm. or how to, how to exercise. You can't do any of that if you won't start setting boundaries and they need to know how to set, set boundaries. They need to know how to say no and not fear that they're going to lose and, and be, you know, have retribution and all of that stuff. So you've got to actually adopt the right kinds of beliefs so that you can pursue the right kinds of behaviors that will actually not just benefit you, but it'll benefit everybody. Yeah. When we set boundaries, bad things don't happen. Good things happen, right? Everybody wins when we set healthy boundaries, right? And that's the new belief that we want to replace that old false belief with, right? Is that when we set healthy boundaries, everybody wins. I have time to prioritize what I need to be a, a fully healthy and whole individual, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and everybody else gets the opportunity to grow and to become autonomous and resilient and independent on their own. And then we can all just be together and be happy and healthy together. And, and we're not learning, you know, these flawed sort of paradigms to live within. So that's just one example under this one. The second one that I think is really important, I know we took a lot of time on that, but I don't want to speed through this. The second one I think we really need to dive into that we see a lot, because we work with a lot, like I said, a lot of moms and dads, but they're all working, almost all of them are working moms and dads. And 
a lot of them are, they travel a lot or they just, they, they find themselves in specific environments with the people that they work with, whether it's customers, maybe they're in sales and they're, 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 in, in, in at dinners and eating out and going to like luncheons and conferences and conventions and doing all this stuff. Um, or even if they're just like teachers, you know, or, or nurses at work, they're around specific people all day long at work, whether it's people who are their superiors at work, um, or they're just people who are their sort of their lateral, um, peers, or it's people that are their direct reports. Um, there, there are all these situations where we hear, examples of these false beliefs and these lies rear their ugly heads that are completely removing all the control that these folks have in these environments. So a great example would be, um, I see this a lot with people in sales, right? People who travel a lot and they end up at restaurants um, and, and bars and things like that with their customers. And they're there to sell them something to strike a deal or to manage a project or whatever it might be. And uh, or maybe they're not even in sales and trying to sell something, but they're out and they're and they're ending up at restaurants and bars and different things like that, um, or conventions with their superiors and their leadership. And there's this fear that of like, if I don't eat what they're eating, mm-hmm. or if I don't drink what they're drinking, right. which is huge with alcohol yeah. al- alcohol consumption in these environments, um, then I'm gonna tick the, I'm going to tick the customer off. I'm going to offend the customer. They're going to think I'm being rude. I'm going to lose the business. I'm going to, I'm going to be seen as not one of the, one of the, the, you know, the elite or like, I'm going to be seen as an outsider or whatever it might be. Um, I see folks get these lies built up in their head, these false beliefs a lot. And because of that, it can almost get to the point where it's like, well, um, I can't, you know, like they're struggling to get results with their, with their weight loss or their goals, but they're traveling all the time and they're finding themselves in these environments all the time. And it gets to the point where they're just like, I, there's nothing I can do. Right. Uh, like the, I, like if I, if I don't do this then the customer is going to be mad and it's like, is that true? It legitimately, is that true? And I think there's a really powerful answer both ways. Most of the time, I don't think that's true. I question that. Yeah, I don't. I I, I call BS, mm-hmm. right? Um, I would say that most of the time, it it will not be true, and most of the time, they don't even care, right? And in a lot of those cases, maybe you're just building that up in your head because you legitimately had the fear, and you're just wrong, right? It's just a, a construct that you built up in your head, and it's not wrong. And when you test it, it's actually not true. They don't care at all, right? Um, because we do that, we build it up on our heads that people care a lot more than they do. Right. Um, or it could be that you built it up in your head because you're looking for an excuse. That's another reality that we have to explore, right? Are you looking for an excuse because you're maybe not ready to make the changes that would be required? Um, but then the other option is maybe it is true. There are some ugly people out there. There are some people out there who, um, are deeply flawed and they have unrealistic expectations. Mm -hmm. And if when you ask yourself, would these people actually legitimately be mad at me or think differently of me if I don't drink with them when I'm out on a business trip and I'm out on business trips three, four, five days a week, and it's completely unsustainable for me to see the kinds of results and to be actually healthy in the way that I need to be if I engage in this. um, If the answer is yes, they legitimately would hold that against you and you would lose the sale or maybe lose your role or, or, or whatever, wouldn't you want to stop and maybe question the should rooms I, that you're in? Yeah, should I even be working with this person in the first place? You know, I'm, well, I'm just saying, you know, like if your goal is to, re, if you legitimately and genuinely want and desire to be healthy, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, all of that, if the if the goals that you're stating that you have for yourself to live a long and healthy and functional life um, for the reasons for the reasons that you say you have them, which is to be there for your family, your kids, and all of that stuff, then and you can't do that because the people that you go out to eat with all the time at work would hold it against you if you didn't drink with them or if you didn't eat pizza with them and instead got a salad or, or you know salads are the worst thing to get at a restaurant most of the time. Say hi, say hi to Joey the cat. Hi, Joey. Come here, Joey. Let's get rid of Joey real quick. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's like, yeah, if uh, 
I, I, I don't recommend salads at restaurants. They're not the, the best option, but right. that's a conversation for a different podcast. Um, but yeah, like if legitimately those people would hold that against you, um, then you can't win. Mm-hmm. Then you have no control. You've given away all of your control because that is the, um, if that is the actual truth in that situation, then you have no control. Mm-hmm. And if you're traveling three, four, five days a week, what can you do, right? So that's where you have to start and actually question, is, are these the types of rooms and these are the types of people that I want to be in? And uh, my guess is the answer is probably no. And then we have bigger decisions to make, right? But most of the case, I don't think that's the case. Most, most times, I do not believe that the people that they're actually going out to eat with or, or in these environments actually really care. Mm-hmm. Um, if anything, how much more of a, of, a, of a show of strength and confidence would it be to actually be the one in the room who doesn't give a crap? Yeah. Who has zero attachment to what other people think Mm -hmm. or who has zero attachment to what other people think about what they're drinking or what they're putting in their body. Because the reality is we have zero obligation to anybody else in the world when it comes to the food that we put into our body or the drink that we put into our body. Right. We owe nothing to, to no one when it comes to that. That's a false belief that we built up. So two great examples of boundaries. Yeah. 100% hundred percent going out and, um, you know, being in those environments and I get it. It's tough. Um, when you've lived with these for a long time, you, you know, it's hard to let go of them, but my encouragement to anybody who's listening to this and you, and you feel a little bit convicted by what we're saying is my, my encouragement to you is just, just like the quote says from or- Orson Scott card. Um, the problem is you've never questioned these beliefs before. I'm asking you to question them because when you question them, one of two things happens. You either realize that they don't hold up or that you're around the wrong people in the wrong environments. Both of which any change will yield great results in your life. No matter which of those two answers is true. Right? Right. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Absolutely. Uh, let's move on to the next one because some, all of these are so deep and so good. We could just talk for forever on these. Um, the next one goes and speaks to relationship with failure. And it's the, uh, the belief of if I fail, I won't be loved. I won't be accepted. I won't be enough. Maybe I'll be alone. And nobody wants to be alone. Uh, but this speaks to the whole belief that failure is something to be avoided at all costs. Right? Um, <clears throat> the, uh, you actually had, a, a, I think, a great... Uh, we had a good discussion right before we started. So talk, talk a little bit about where we, what you were talking about, how people associate, uh, what people associate with, with failure, and what they could or should associate with failure. Yeah. It was actually something that I heard from, from Tony Robbins. He was talking about how people do things for pleasure or for pain. And, you know, those decisions are all based on either avoiding pain or trying to gain pleasure. But most people, or actually everyone, will do anything to avoid pain more than Mm -hmm. trying to gain pleasure. And what a lot of people struggle with is that they associate failure with pain Mm. and that, you know, the failure is just like what everything that you said, failure is going to lead to people not loving me or me being, you know, looking like a, like an idiot or, you know, being, being an outcast or, Mm -hmm. you know, those specific pains. Whereas, you know, when, when we were first discussing before the, the podcast started, it was um, su- successful people relate to pain as, as more of a learning experience. Or, uh, mm-hmm. excuse me, they associate failure to a learning experience mm-hmm. rather than pain. Yeah. So I think that's where the difference between, you know, associating, you know, the, the fear of failure, um, how both ends look at that, whether that's a successful person or someone who's just trying to avoid pain in yeah. general. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't know. I think we, a lot of us, most of us, if not all of us in our sort of our domestication, you know, growing up in our younger, uh, more impressionable years as children, young children, and then into like adolescent hood, we acquire a lot of these beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. That too, especially through school. Oh man, school is yeah. like brutal. Yeah. Right. That's where I uh, I acquired most of my horrible yeah. false beliefs about if you the fail, world. you suck. 
Yeah, basically, it's, if you fail, you suck. Um, you know, even just like you think about our grading systems in school, right? Yeah, you know, it's F, really terrible. F failure. You know, right. um, and there's just we don't learn how to learn really in school in the way that I think is the powerful way. Yeah. We 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 develop this relationship with failure um, where we truly believe that failure is just pain. Yeah. Failure is something to be avoided at all cost. Um, that failure speaks to our weakness. And, and the other thing I think is that people just take failure deeply personally. Yeah. Right. Um, like if I fail, I am a failure. Yeah. Right. And nobody wants a failure. Yeah. Nobody wants to be with a failure. Nobody wants to love a failure. Nobody wants to be intimate with a failure. Nobody wants to marry a failure. Nobody wants to hang out with a failure. Um, and so by God, we've got to avoid failure at all cost. Right. And here's the problem. Um, failure is a normal uh, unavoidable part of life. hundred percent. So if you're trying to avoid failure, you're essentially avoiding life, mm -hmm. right? You are just sitting around, not taking risks, um, not doing anything of value, not producing anything of value because you're too afraid of failure. Um, a f fear of failure and avoidance of failure almost always equates to just completely being stuck, right? Um, we see it happen with, with clients, and I know a lot of people out there will resonate with that, um, that their fear of failure keeps them stuck in one spot, stagnant. Um, and they just don't know what to do with it, right? And the other, the other horrible thing about this belief is that not only does it cause us to avoid failure, but the problem is we can't avoid failure. We're still going to fail. So if you have this horrible belief that failure is this horrible, um, terrible thing, that speaks deeply personally to who we are as a person, right? And your value in the world. Um, then now every failure that you accumulate, you actually collect those failures and then you just carry them with you and you constantly bring them back up when you're like laying in bed at night and you play back through them and, and what, what, you know, I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I messed that up, you know, and you, you don't actually pull any value out of them, but you collect them. And now what you're doing is you're collecting all of this proof in your mind of just how horrible you are mm. and how incompetent or whatever that might be. So this relationship with failure, this false belief about failure sets us up not only to not actually learn and grow and achieve and, and, and progress in the ways that we want to and achieve the things that we want to in life, but it also signs us up for a, a really horrible relationship with ourselves with z almost zero self-confidence, it signs us up for a life of, um, you know, like poor self-confidence and avoidance and um, misery, really. 100%. You know, depression, yeah. anxiety. I think a lot of the depression and the anxiety and the mental health crisis that we experience now is really rooted. It's rooted in several things, but this is one of the big ones. Yeah. If right. you're not growing, you're dying. If you're not growing, you're dying. And and you can't grow if you're afraid of failure, if you're yeah. deathly afraid of failure, right? So um, so this one is a huge one. So what do we do? Like, how do we reframe this belief into something that's actually turns failure into something useful? And that's what I think the most successful people in the world have done. When you stop and you actually start to study very, very successful people in the world, people who we might look up to as some of our heroes who don't struggle in the same ways that maybe we're struggling right now. They're further down along the path of success that we want to tread down. Um, you start to look at these people, you realize they have a totally different, excuse me, relationship with failure. Mm -hmm. um, they don't look at failure in the same way that typical people who are struggling in this way look at failure. They look at failure, like you said, they don't look at, excuse me, look at failure as pain. They might know that with failures and mistakes comes some element of pain, right? But they're also not turning around and just inflicting more and more and more pain upon themselves because they failed. They know it's necessary. They know it's necessary. They understand that the pain and the sting that comes with mistakes and failure is, is simply a, a, a signal. It's a signal that there is something to be learned, a lesson to be extracted, a value to be extracted from this experience. And ultimately, because of that, they see it as an opportunity, right? A lot of people, that's why a lot of people in the business world, very successful people in the business world, um, don't struggle in this way. Because they're, they're, acute, they're like very acutely attuned to 
seeing opportunity and recognizing signals. And they use that in their relationship with failure as well. So when they mess up, you, they, you, they could never build a successful business if every time they failed, they were just like, I'm a failure, I might as well stop, right? right? So instead, they ha in order for them to be successful and keep going and to achieve whatever they want to achieve, they had to figure out how do I turn failures into something valuable so that I can keep going and keep going and keep going? And so now they've basically trained themselves and, and to, to see opportunity in failure, right? To see, and when you, when you shift that, you turn that corner, well now all of a sudden, if failure is actually opportunity, isn't opportunity something that we all want? Isn't opportunity that we, something that we actually want more of? I want more opportunity in my life. Do you want more opportunity in your life? Absolutely. I mean, bring all the opportunity. I, give me all the opportunities that I could possibly get. If failure actually equals opportunity and failure actually means there's value to be had, then I want more failure. Mm -hmm. And when you look at successful people, that's actually how they operate. Right. They, they fail early. They fail fast. They fail forward because they're extracting value and learning and growth out of their failures. And then they're moving on to the next failure as quickly as possible, extracting that value and that growth and that learning out of that one and then moving on to the next one, right? And a great example of this, I think, is, is scientists, right? Scientists of the world, they study all manner of different things, whether it's in biology or vaccines or medications and medical discoveries or, or whatever it might be. What I love about scientists is that literally their job is to go into work every day to come up with a hypothesis to test that they know almost every time is going to result in a failure. And then that's the scientific method, right? I come up with a hypothesis, I run the experiment and test it. It's almost always a failure, but then I extract value and learning from that experiment and that failure that I apply to the next experiment. That one fails, I extract value and learning from that one and I go to the next one Right, scientists and inventors do this all the time. And the reality is we have a lot to learn from their relationship with failure, don't we? Mm -hmm. Because if they had the relationship with failure that a lot of people in the world have with failure, where it's this horrible thing and we can't do it, how would they ever be able to actually progress to the point where they have like medical breakthroughs and come up with all of these amazing things that they've come up with? Um, a lot of people have heard the story of Thomas Edison when he, when he invented the light bulb. I don't know if this is 100% true, but this is something that I, I've heard a million times, but that he went through a, roughly a thousand revisions, failed revisions of the light bulb before he figured out the actual um, like version of the light bulb that worked, right? right. So he, he failed a, roughly a thousand times, made a thousand broken, unfunctional light bulbs. Mm -hmm. before he actually made the light bulb that worked, right? I mean, t take a moment and just let that sit with you for a second. Most people don't want to fail once, and they will do everything in their power not to fail just even once in front of people. That man failed a thousand times before he got it right. What, like, what kind of mindset does it take to be willing to fail a thousand times before you achieve the breakthrough. Mm -hmm. That's an incredible and extreme example, but that's what I love about the scientists and the, you know, the, the inventors of the world is that they are so willing to fail because they actually could not be successful in their endeavors without failure, right? Failure is actually the key ingredient. Failure is actually the catalyst that'll, that creates the breakthrough, mm -hmm. right? And I think that is a golden lesson that, uh, that we have to apply in all of our lives if we want to be successful in anything and especially if we want to be happy, Yeah. right? Because uh, otherwise, like I said, we're just living in a life of kind of, you know, avoidance, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I really wish our clients, you know, that's the thing that we... We like spend a lot of time with our clients at Healthy and Whole, trying to instill within them as well. Because I, I, I would say majority of folks who come into um, a coaching relationship with us are coming in with this 
relationship with failure. You see that with your clients? Yeah, hundred percent. The relationship with failure also kind of gets them in this terrible mindset of, you know, I'll be happy when I reach mm -hmm. this, or I'll be happy mm -hmm. um, if I look like this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're constantly putting off their, their happiness and it doesn't make any sense. Like, mm -hmm. you know, the, they're not happy with the, the process or the fact that they're learning mm -hmm. and the fact that they're going to be there eventually. Um, it's, it, it goes back to, um, you know, when I was saying to people, it's, it's just change your approach. Like there's, mm -hmm. there's an approach that works for you in your specific situation. And, you know, we might try something and it doesn't work out and mm -hmm. that is totally okay. It's yeah. like, I'm not upset about it. Yep. I mean, you shouldn't be either. It's, it's, you know, it's just something that we can just mark off as, you know, something we tried and yeah. we just look at something else and change our approach and we'll, we'll find something. Yeah. And, you know, just be happy with the fact that we're working towards that and we're yeah. continuously making process progress. Yeah. 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 But, you know, the the reason I think people sort of avoid that or they don't naturally find their way to that, again, goes back to the fear. Yeah. Right. You know, if I try and I fail, then X, Y and Z will 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 come into reality and it, it will challenge my needs, my deep human needs for love and acceptance and connection significance and safety, you know, all of that stuff. Um, we, we, we kind of are wired to believe is at risk if we try and if we fail, but the reality is that failure is opportunity. Failure is actually the key ingredient to success. Um, it is the catalyst to the growth that leads to the results that you actually want in life. And it is not something to be avoided, but it is something to be pursued, right? Uh, the last thing I'll say before we move on to the next belief here, um, another analogy that I really, really love and I use all the time because there is pain associated with failure. Mm -hmm. Un it's hard to avoid that, real that reality. And sometimes the pain and the sting associated with failures and mistakes can be quite intense. Um, you know, I, like I have made mistakes investing money into certain things that just didn't pan out. You know, this last year, I, um, in 2022, I invested $50,000 cash into, into an initiative that I thought was going to pan out a certain way and it didn't, you know? Um, we, we made a little bit of progress, but it didn't at all go the way that I thought it was going to be. Yeah. And um, that was painful, man, like very painful to invest that kind of money that I took out of my family and our assets and I invested it into that thing. And it would be easy for me as a, as a father, as a husband, as, as a man to say, uh, to, go, to go really dark and really negative with myself and say, man, like how could you not know better? Like, why did you do that? What, what a waste, you know? Um, but instead, I, I, I looked at that experience and I said, what value can I extract? How do I extract $50,000 worth of value and learning out of this experience? And I did, you know? And so the analogy that I love to end with here with this particular false belief is that um, failure, the pain of failure is tuition that we pay to learn lessons in the school of life. So every time I experience a painful failure or a painful mistake, I ask, I just, I immediately stop. I've trained myself to immediately stop and say, this is the tuition that I'm paying. What am I going to learn in exchange for this tuition that I'm paying? Mm -hmm. Right. And if I can stop and, and understand that the pain is my tuition and that I'm getting equivalent value back for that pain and that tuition, then I can now close the book on that failure and move on. And I can actually look back. This is really important. It's important that I do that and that we all learn to do that because then we can look back on mistakes and failures fondly, right? We can look back into our past on mistakes and failures that we've experienced in our lives and see them fondly with gratitude. And this is extremely important. I, I didn't want to gloss over this and, and, and not bring this up because a lot of people spend a lot of time in their past you know, when they're at night, you know, laying in bed, they're going back into their past and they're replaying situations and, and events in their life from a very negative uh, energy, right? And 
if they would just go back to those, extract the value, uh, understand that the pain they experienced was the tuition in exchange for that value, learn the lessons, close the book on it and move on, then they could actually look back on those experiences and say, I got some amazing value and life lessons out of that. I'm glad it happened. Right. I look back on my previous marriage um, that I, 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 I was married uh, once before. Um, it was a very painful experience, very painful divorce. And for a few years, I harbored a lot of like really negative energy around it and resentment. But now I'm able to look back on that whole experience and even the person, the other person in that relationship fondly, right? I hold, harbor no ill will toward that person. I can look back on it and realize, realize and recognize that we were both um, broken in our own ways and flawed in our own ways and that we both had fault and we both were contributing in different ways to that situation. And I can extract so much learning and experience from that that I can now use today in my current life with our clients in the program and things like that. And so now I can look back on that and I can, I can actually look back on, on her and that situation with gratitude because I wouldn't be the coach I am today and I wouldn't be who I am today without it, right? And so I think to end that whole discussion on failure, uh, just to, to kind of bring us full circle is, is don't be afraid of failure. Right? Failure is not something deeply personal. It's a tool. Failure is a tool. It's unavoidable, so we might as well use it. It's necessary. It's necessary. It's unavoidable. There's only ever been one person in the entire existence that I can think of, and his name is Jesus Christ, who probably never failed. Right? The utter picture of perfection. Nobody else measures up. You're not going to. I'm not going to. Colton's not going to. Uh, so we have to learn to live with failure. And the best way to live with failure is to use the heck out of it mm -hmm. and use it as a powerful tool in your life. So I hope that helps some of you out there um, rephrase or reframe your relationship with failure. And I think this is a great segue into the third one here, which is perfection. We talked about failure and these two are very closely linked. The next one is perfection, right? Perfection is the standard. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if I can't do it perfectly, I'm a failure. How do you see this when showing up a lot? This drives me so crazy <laughs> because I hear a lot of times people will say, they're like, well, I'm either all in or all out. And it's like, really? Like, come on. And they, they say like, oh, well, you know, I either have to do everything right or it's just like, you know, just count me out. And it makes zero sense. It's like, mm -hmm. you can't expect yourself to, you know, start a journey mm -hmm. and do every single thing to the T just completely right. And it's like, that. it's unrealistic for anyone. I don't even do everything yeah. perfectly every single day. And I'm a coach. Like, right. Like nothing is perfect in my life. Like wow. there's different circumstances. I have non-negotiables and sure. I'm, you know, I set a very high standard for myself. And you still but, don't always live up to those. Right. But you know, I've also been doing it for a while and I've learned and I've failed mm -hmm. and you know, I've gotten to this point where I'm at now. But to expect yourself to be all in and, you know, not have like a, you know, like a healthy obsession or anything, but, you know, to, to expect yourself to get everything done all the time, 100% yeah. of the time is unrealistic. It's just totally. completely unrealistic. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I asked myself, like, as I was thinking about this, where does this come from? Because like I said before, when we are growing up, it's usually in our younger, like most impressionable, impressionable years that we acquire a lot of this. But even now I, I see things in our current day in society that are really making it a lot worse. Like social media is one. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, you know, people don't tend, most people don't tend to put their imperfections and their, and their flaws out there on social media. Some people do, but most people don't. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to the media, the things that we see on TV and that are portrayed on TV, in the media, on YouTube, a lot of the time, social media, influencers, all of this stuff, we acquire this belief that there are perfect people out there. There are people out there who lead perfect lives, they look perfect, their, their bodies, their hair, their face, everything is curated perfectly. They have perfect careers. They have perfect relationships. Their mood is always perfect. Their mood is always perfect. It's BS. Yeah. None of it is true, yeah. right? Everybody has their stuff. Mm -hmm. 
nobody is perfect. Going back to what I said before, there's been one perfect person in the history of the world, and that was Jesus Christ. Everyone else, total train wreck. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> you know? 100%. <laughs> and, I, and I fall into that category as well a lot of the time, to be completely honest. Um, but this belief that perfect per, that perfection is the standard because we've, we've we, again, like Orson Scott Card says, we, we never stop to question these beliefs. We, we see it on social media. We see it on TV. Um, maybe when we were growing up, we were held to an unrealistic standard by someone who was raising us, mm. you know, um, or in school or whatever it might be. And we, we get to this belief that, that we have to be perfect. And then if we can't be perfect, there's no point in trying or that we're going to be a failure. And we already talked about failure and what yeah. that means if yeah. we have that relationship with failure. So you see how it all kind of starts to interweave itself together. And, and you know, you can probably start to see, you know, a lot of you who are listening, probably when we, when we were initially talking about, you know, boundaries and, and expectations, you were like, oh, yeah, that's me. I struggle with that. And then we got to talking about failure and like, oh, man, that's me, too. Mm. And now we're talking about perfection. You're like, yeah. oh, that's me too. Yep. That's me too. You can start to see how a lot of us have, at one point in time in our life, had all of these false beliefs. Mm -hmm. You know, all of them. And when they all are burdening you down, it's really hard to be happy. And it's really hard to, to be healthy and whole, which is why we're talking about yep. all this, right? And so the thing is, Perfection is a fool's standard, right? Perfection is a fool's standard. I don't know where I heard that, but I loved it when I heard it. Um, cr credit to whoever originally said it. Um, but I truly believe that, and I, and I try to live my life by that. Perfection is a fool's standard, right? Um, I opened up this podcast kind of nodding to that, right? We don't even have a name for this podcast. We'll yeah. eventually come up with something cool. We'll put a little graphic up on the screen when we're doing our thing, and then it'll just it'll be... It'll be amazing yeah. when we come up with the perfect name for it, right? But we haven't done it yet. Um, but if we waited until we had the perfect name, yeah. we still wouldn't be sitting here talking about this delivering value. That, yeah, I hope delivering value that people are getting value out of. Um, perfection will prevent us from doing anything of value, mm -hmm. right? Um, or we get stuck in this constant start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. Yep. You know, how does it show up? Here, here's how I see it show up all the time. Uh, especially with our clients, is Monday, I'm ready to go. New week, brand new week, let's go. I've got my food ready to go. I packed my lunch for work. I'm off. I'm planning to work out on Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. And I've got my, my water, my hydration, my, my water bottle. Everything's good to go. I'm ready to go. And as they say, like, you know, man plans and God laughs, <laughs> you know? Yep. And then like life happens. And then uh, a lot of times people just, you know, especially in the beginning of a weight loss journey, you, you just don't have the knowledge and the skill to be able to roll with everything and to get it per, and we're not perfect, right? We're just not perfect. So like they make their first mistake and normally it's like at 10 a.m. on Monday or noon or maybe 3 p.m. on a Monday and they're like, well, I already screwed it up. Right. I'll start next Monday. Yeah. And so the whole rest of that day, they're like, well, I might as well just binge or I might as well just like throw in the towel for today. I'll start tomorrow. Or a lot of people just say, I'll start again next week, right? And again, you're trying to hold yourself to this image of perfection when if you would have just, the moment you kind of had a little bit of a misstep at 10 a.m. or noon or 3 p.m., just gotten right back on track, you could have recovered. You could have finished strong, right? You still had six more days in the week to, to make it work, right? But you've got this false belief in your head that it's perfect, it's black or white. It's, mm -hmm. it's all in or all out. It's perfect or it's nothing. Mm -hmm. And again, to, to speak to more of the lessons that I've learned or what I've seen emu emulated by people far more successful than me, they don't operate that way. Instead, similarly to their relationship with failure, their approach is that imperfect work is sort of the goal, right? Because if we put imperfect work out into the world or imperfect action out into the world, we can then just put in reps and put in reps and reps and reps and get better at it. And that's how mastery happens, right? Repetition, 
uh, what's the saying? Repetition is the uh, key to mastery or something like yep. that, right? And, but you don't, you're not gonna put in reps if you're afraid of not doing it perfectly. Um, I, I can't remember the exact details of it, but I've heard of this study they did with pottery students. And they did, they had a pottery class and they had students um, plan and like they had like, they had to do one project, one pottery project, like make one pot that could be as perfect as they could. And then they had the other group of students um, make like 30 different pots. And it was interesting how the people, the kids who made 30 different pots, their 30th pot was way better than the people who spent 30 days trying to make the perfect pot. Right. And it's because the kids who went and made 30 pots put in the reps and they learned from every pot. And every time they did a pot, they, they made a pot, it got better and better and better and better. And then after making 30 pots, their pots were actually really good. And then the one person who only made one pot but tried like super hard to plan it out perfectly and to design it perfectly and to like get it, get the technique just right and all that stuff. And they only did one. Theirs kind of sucked. Mm -hmm. And a great, beautiful example of, you know, the whole uh, ready, fire, aim. Yep mentality that we see here a lot in the, like the business world, right? Like just take action. Yep. Like fire your first shot, see where it lands, then adjust your aim. Yeah. Fire the second shot, adjust your aim again, fire the third shot, right? Mm -hmm. This podcast is actually a beautiful example of that. Yep. You know, we, we, we were actually, we were having uh, a meeting, a coffee at Starbucks, what, two weeks ago? Mm -hmm. And we said, we need to do the podcast. And I sat right there and I said, we're going to put it on the calendar right now so that we have no excuses. We're, we're not gonna sit here and try to make it perfect. We're gonna put it on the calendar. We don't even know what we're gonna talk about, but we're going to record next Friday at 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. And we put it on and we did it. Don't even have a name for the podcast yet. Yep. You know, but I think it's been fun. It's, yeah, it's been I, fun so I, far. I think it's, I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying it. Yeah. Um, and at the end of the day, I, I hope people get value out of it and I hope they enjoy it too. But at the end of the day, I can't be attached to that. Right. Right. Um, so, it's kind of like the podcast will never be perfect, but it will get better and better and better every episode. I already feel like this episode is better than the last. Mm -hmm. And the last one, I said, um, a lot. I still have said it a few times. I said, right, a lot. Uh, I, there are things that I said a lot. Yeah. And as I was editing the video, I was like, man, <laughs> this is painful. <laughs> you say, um, and you say, like, and you say, right, a lot. Be a terrible speaker. <laughs> On stage. So I'm trying really hard not to say those words yes. any more than I have to. And I, I feel like I have said it less than I did last time. So perfection is a full standard. Uh, it, it will just like it won't it won't prevent you from failing. And if you combine a reframed belief of failure with a reframed belief around the fact that perfection is a full standard, you could be dangerous. You could be dangerous in how far and how fast you see results and you learn and you grow, whether you're building a business, whether you're building your body, whatever it is, whew, you can be dangerous if you combine those two, you reframe those two false beliefs in your life. That's powerful stuff. Right. Right. A hundred percent. All right. We've been uh, going for almost an hour, so we're going to hit the, hit up the last one here, Yes. which is one of my favorite, and that is that vulnerability is a weakness. And weakness is death, right? 100%. Vulnerability is a weakness. Weakness is death. And this one, um, this one is really near and dear to my heart um, because I spent probably the first half of my adult and young adult life with a lot of anxiety. And a lot of my anxiety and my depression was born out of worrying what other people thought about me. And it was to the point where, I, like, I, I give this example sometimes, but this is how um, deeply this can like, get rooted, right? Um, when I was you know, younger in like, high school years and stuff like that, I would get sometimes invited to a party or something like that. And I, I remember specific memories. I always hated driving like, into the party. Because when I would turn into a party or a gathering into the driveway, there would always 
already be, you know, because you're supposed to show up fashionably late, right? Right. To a, to a party. You're not supposed to be the first one yeah, there. It's in the rule right? book. Because yeah. if you show up and you're first one there, then obviously you have no life and, you know, you're needy, right? <laughs> I, just, I don't know. I just made that up. But, like, so you can't, you got to be cool. You got to be fashionably late. So I'm showing up fashionably late to these gatherings and these parties. And, um, but I would pull in. And I would see usually cars everywhere, people parked in the grass because, you know, there's always way more cars than you can fit in a driveway. And Your heart's there's people, pounding. There's people like out front, like on the like like watching me pull in and my heart starts to pound. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my gosh, everybody's watching me. Yep. And I'm like, everybody's gonna watch me park. Like what if I like <laughs> Like, what if I look like an idiot? Like, I don't know how to back into a parking spot or I don't know how to pull into a parking spot or like, I was just like, what are people going to think of me? I would have anxiety pulling in to a dang party, worrying about what people are going to think of me as I pull into a parking spot in the grass. What if my truck gets stuck? What if my car gets stuck? Like, what, what is that going to look like? Are people going to laugh at me because I can't get out of here? Like, all this stuff going through my head and all of it really was because... I was worried what they were going to think about me. And I was worried that like, you know, like uh, being vulnerable, like pe people seeing that I'm a, f a flawed, not perfect dude, mm -hmm. you know? So I went through like the whole first, I, well, let's, let's call it like, g like elementary school, like going into junior high, I think is when I really started to feel this way all the way through probably my early thirties before I started to reframe this and understand that I was wrong. And I had so much social anxiety. Mm. and even depression because I was totally worried about kind of having to be perfect because, you know, on the other side of vulnerability is, is, you know, strength, right? And, uh, vulnerability is an imperfection mm -hmm. we think, right? So when I say vulnerability is a weakness, this is a false belief that I think crops up because we try to hide our imperfections. We try to hide our flaws and we don't want people to see that we have flaws or imperfections and that we can't rise to the occasion, right? And so this starts to color our decision-making processes, right? We see this all the time with clients who take on way too much. They say yes to everything. Again, going back to no boundaries, right? I say yes to every project at work. I say yes to every request from my kids. I say yes to every, you know, request from a, another person in my life. I just say yes, 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 yes. Because if I say no, oh man, they might, they might think that I can't, I can't take care of it all, right? That I can't live up to, you know, the expectations or whatever it is. Or I see this all the time when it comes to mistakes, right? Um, people who, who are deathly afraid to admit that they made a mistake or they messed up. So they hide it, mm -hmm. right? Um, or they just don't engage. They just take themselves out of the game entirely because they don't want to even have to run the risk of looking vulnerable, right? So this one is important to me because, it, it, you know, like I said, it drove a lot of social anxiety for me. And it, it, I, I endured a lot of my own self-inflicted suffering and pain for a lot of years out of this one false belief. And here's what I learned about it that I think really was this turning point for me that changed my life and helps to start pulling me out of depression and anxiety to where now I, I, I don't experience uh, only but like very rare situational like depression or anxiety brought on by a, 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 you know, an acute situation. And even then it's like a one out of 10, you know, before I handle it mentally and I move on. But what really helped me turn the corner, I think for me was recognizing that uh, vulnerability is actually strength and that vulnerability is protection. And I learned that from seeing heroes of mine and people that I wanted to learn from mentors of mine model that. And what it looked like was they were the first ones to point out their flaws to everybody in the world. Um, they were the first people to say, I messed up, I failed, um, I'm flawed, I'm broken, um, sometimes I'm a jerk, you know, sometimes I get things wrong, sometimes I'm obsessive, like whatever the, the dialogue may be, they're the first ones to say it, right? And what I love about it is that when we're talking about vulnerability as a strength, right? I think that that is a very, very powerful statement, right? Because um, 
my vulnerability, if I'm willing to be vulnerable to you, right? And you've, you've seen examples where maybe I made a mistake with a client or maybe I coached someone and in, in, in in it didn't land right. Um, what do I do in those situations? You're always like, yeah, well, that sucks, but it is what it is. You know, just take it as it is. You know, so you're kind of nonchalant about it. Like it yeah. sucks in the moment, but yeah. you eat it up and, or you don't, you know, let it eat you. You just kind of yeah. take it as a learning lesson. Exactly. Right. You know, I, I apply what I applied with failure. Right. Yeah. And, you know, we actually had a, a situation recently where this happened. What did I do? I, I exact same thing. I reacted in that way. I pulled some learning and extracted some learning from it. But then I actually went to that client and I told them that I messed up. Yeah. And I told them that, um, you know, I, I broke down what I was thinking and why I made the decisions that I did and why I coached in the way that I did in that moment in that it was wrong and that it didn't land right and it didn't have the outcome that I expected it would. And, uh, I apologized and I said, I, I told them what I had learned from it. You know what I'm saying? Like I just, yeah. my vulnerability in that moment turned into learning and turned in, turned into strength. But what it did is it actually drew that client back to me. Yeah. It drew us closer. Right. And with, you know, social media being what it is and the whole perfect standards that are out there in the world. Um, though we have these heroes that we see on social media and, and things like that, we also don't really oftentimes feel like we can relate to those people because they're what they're putting out into the world. While we may aspire to it, we don't feel like we have much in common with that because deep down we all know that we're broken. Deep down, we all know that we are flawed and we are not perfect. And so what I love about vulnerability is that my willingness to share pretty much anything and all be completely transparent and open about my, I've been open with the, in social media and with the, with the world um, and with our clients and with anybody who asks about my struggles with drinking, right? I've been open about my struggles with depression and anxiety, my past marriage, um, just like anything. I, I'm willing to bear it all for others to see because I think that deep down everybody else knows that they're, they feel the same way mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. And my ability to be vulnerable does two things. Number one, it draws people closer, right? Because they feel like they can be who they are, right? If I'm being who I actually am, which is a flawed, broken human individual, then you can be who you want to be. You can be who you need to be. You can just be you, right? You don't have to, if I'm trying to, to not be vulnerable, right? Then you have to feel like you can't be vulnerable either, mm -hmm. right? So if I'm trying to put on the image that I'm not a flawed individual, then you're not going to allow yourself to be that as well. Mm -hmm. Right. And it just causes problems. See, it, it causes this, this, this void in relationships. Yeah. Right. Um, but I, I, what I have learned is that when I learn to be vulnerable, my relationships, the quality and the closeness of my relationships with everybody in my life deepened like to a huge degree. Um, and it drew a lot of people closer to me. And ironically, it repelled some people that needed to be repelled. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know? Yeah. Which is interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. But the other thing I said is vulnerability is protection. And um, this one I think is just important because a lot of people, when it comes to being vulnerable or admitting faults and, and mistakes and things like that, they avoid it because of why? Fear. Fear. Right? Fear of what? Fear of failure. Fear of failure. What does failure mean? Failure means pain. Failure means pain. It means, it means I won't be loved. Yep. I won't be enough. I may be alone, right? There's a lot of things that, again, go into that. But what I love about being vulnerable and being quick to be vulnerable with people and totally open and transparent with people all the time is that nobody has anything to hurt you with mm -hmm. when you lead with vulnerability, right? When I am the first one to admit and to tell everybody with, 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 without shame or guilt, um, but just honesty and transparency and truth that I struggle with drinking at times, right? Or that I sometimes mess up as a coach. I read the, the, you know, the situation wrong or whatever it might be. Or sometimes I, I'm in a, a you know, a funk and I, and I'm a jerk 
Yep. Sometimes you know, a little too abrasive. Sometimes I'm too abrasive. Sometimes yeah. I, you know, I'm I'm too hard on Lachlan, you know, my daughter. Or sometimes I'm insensitive with Joni. You know, like if I'm the first to admit those things, nobody can hurt me with them, right? Because I'm not trying to hide them, mm-hmm. right? You, I, I'm not afraid of being found out. I, I've told everybody who I am. And everybody knows that I'm a work in progress. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows that I'm not perfect. Now I don't, I don't have anything to live up to. Everybody knows that I'm just a dude who's, who's learning every day and failing from experiment to experiment and knows that I am broken and flawed. So I don't need anybody else to tell me that. And if they did, that's okay because I've already told them. Mm-hmm. You know, So that's the beautiful thing I think about vulnerability is we, w- when we've reframed this fear and this false belief that vulnerability is a weakness and we understand that it's actually a strength that draws people close closer to us and that actually protects us then now all of a sudden we don't want to avoid vulnerability now all of a sudden we actually pursue vulnerability in the same that we can act way that we can actually start to pursue failure mm-hmm. and that we can actually start to pursue imperfection you're starting to see a, a trend here mm-hmm. aren't you yeah they all connect in some way shape or form right they all connect in it's 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 here's a great thing to, I think, to start to wrap this up and summarize all of this with is when you start to see the pattern that we acquire these false beliefs that cause us to avoid a lot of these things, right? We avoid setting boundaries because of these false beliefs and their fear-based beliefs. We avoid um, saying no or holding our ground and, and, and um, we avoid um, holding our values in certain situations like when we talked about those who travel a lot and 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 feel like they need to eat or or drink a certain way right when we stand by our values and we hold our boundaries good things happen but our false beliefs treat us teach us to avoid them right same thing with failure those false beliefs teach us to avoid failure when failure is actually the catalyst for growth these false beliefs teach us to avoid imperfection avoid putting imperfect work out into the world um, when actually imperfect world is, is is imperfect work and imperfect action is the fastest way mm-hmm. to learn and to grow and to put in the reps and to be successful. And when we believe that vulnerability is weakness, we avoid vulnerability. When in reality, vulnerability is what draws people closer to us and actually protects us and takes other people's power away from being able to hurt us. Right? When we do have all of these false beliefs. We avoid, we avoid, we avoid, we avoid. And as a person of faith, I deeply believe that the enemy of our souls, uh, who, who we will not say his name and give him that honor, but the enemy, enemy of our souls, I believe, has worked for generations and generations and generations to, to build up these false beliefs to where they are actually sort of imprinted upon us uh, and passed down from generation to generation, our parents, your grandparents, great grandparents, pass them down to our grandparents, pass them down to our parents, pass them down to us, right? But we have the opportunity to undo that. And I believe that the enemy of our souls weave these into our culture and weave these into our our our, our generational learning, because what do they do? They cause us to avoid living out the lives that we are meant to live out. Mm-hmm. They cause us to avoid becoming the people that we are meant to become and serving in the way that we are meant to serve, mm-hmm. right? And when we start to unravel these false beliefs and turn them 180 degree around, we start pursuing boundaries and doing things for the right reasons for the greater good, not just in, in exchange for love or, or for our own benefit. We, we start holding our values in high regard and defending them. We start pursuing failure so that we can learn faster and progress faster. We start pursuing imperfect, imperfect action and imperfect um, and not fearing imperfection. We actually start to pursue it and use it to put in the reps uh, to go further and faster in life. And we start pursuing vulnerability so that we can be closer and safer than we've ever been in our entire lives. And Um, so I think that is the real goal here is to no longer fear these things, but to turn them completely on their head and, and bring yourself to a place where you can fully acknowledge that 
though you have held these beliefs for probably many years, if not decades of your life, and they have not served you, but they have held you back and even imprisoned you, um, that you can, it's never too late to stop and to question them and to turn them on their head and to move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have any, any last thoughts as we kind of round out this uh, discussion on false beliefs? It's definitely something that I've struggled with. I think in a different sense though, like vulnerability, um, you know, to me, I've always been, I've always had a hard time kind of like opening up or, mm -hmm. you know, feeling like a burden mm -hmm. in some situations, which can um, kind of, yeah, it brings, it comes back to what you were saying. Like, you know, it makes people feel like they can't be open and honest with mm -hmm. you whenever, you know, you're kind of a closed door or um, silencing or suppressing feelings or mm -hmm. certain um, you know, moods and situations or, you know, thoughts, um, that come up or, or things that, you know, you've, you've gone through. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it can kind of cause relationships or, you know, even as a, mm -hmm. a coach, you know, it can kind of dampen those relationships, mm -hmm. um, you know, cause they feel like they can't say those things around you or, you know, yeah. they have a perception of you that you don't have those same problems. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I totally relate. And, um, Definitely something that, that I'm still working on mm -hmm. to this day, but, um, you know, just being vulnerable about my vulnerability. So <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I totally resonate with that. Yeah. Um, to be fair, you know, to anybody who's listening, I still wrestle with all of these. Oh yeah. Just because yeah. I'm on this podcast talking about these does not mean I have reached this stage of my life where I never fall prey to these. Um, again, I'm a, I'm a flawed, broken, imperfect human being who's just on the journey, you know, to learn and to put in the reps with all of these, I still fall prey. There are still moments where I let my guard down and I find myself um, sort of back in some kind of mode when it comes to these. Um, but the whole purpose of us bringing this to everybody in this particular episode is to create awareness. To, is just to open your eyes like someone opened my eyes and, and, and your eyes so that we can be aware just like Orson Scott Card says, so we can actually start to question mm. the beliefs that we have and maybe not cling so tightly to some of the beliefs that do not serve us and have not served us and to actually start to question them and to start to actually like ask ourselves, you know, why do I do some of the things that I do? What's driving that? And how can I you dig a little bit deeper and, and reframe some of these false, false beliefs so that I can make more meaningful progress towards yeah. the life and the identity that I want to live. Yeah. Um, that I can be more consistent with my habits and my food and my workouts and my nutrition and all of that stuff without all of this getting in the way. Yep. You know, if you're creating a story, you might as well make one that serves you. That's true. Might as well. hundred percent. All right, guys. We're, uh, I don't know how long we went, about an hour and a half here. So great, great discussion. We're going to end it here. Um, if you're watching this on our YouTube channel at some point in time, we would really appreciate if you found this valuable. If you would please hit the like button and hit the subscribe button. And that way you get notifications when we release new episodes. And um, I don't know, I'll probably put links down below in the description of our other social media channels if you want to follow us there and outside of that we will see you guys on the next episode of the unnamed currently podcast <laughs>